The title is Achaeans, Hittites, uh, and the Tale of Troy. This is my third lecture to the Friends. It's an honour to have been invited to speak to you again, though I did wonder whether the picture on the invitation would put everybody off. I had to think of a caption for it, and it is, uh, Methuselah contemplates the Minoans of Kithara. <laughs> <coughs> this evening, uh, I intend to discuss both Hittite texts and Homeric tradition, and then to ask whether or not Homer in the 8th century BC recalls in any degree the history of the late Bronze Age societies in Greece and Asia Minor, that is to say, the Turkey of today. You may well ask what a Greek scholar is doing in attempting to investigate Hittite texts written in the cuneiform script. In explanation of the intrusion into a subject not mine own, I can plead that I was privileged some 60 years ago to have received tutorials in Hittite grammar and transcribed texts from Oliver Gurney, a leading Hittite specialist of the time. The tutorials enabled me to write a small monograph, now in part obsolete, but still cited, with the title Achaeans and Hittites. It was published in 1960 and is still cited in the literature nowadays, which is, I suppose, rather flattering. I'm delighted to be able to return to the subject now and to reflect upon the testimonies in the light of more recent discoveries and re-edited and redated texts. There are many pertinent documents. I must be selective. <coughs> Early in the 20th century, German excavations at the Hittite capital, Hattushas, in Central Asia Minor, in the Halys Bend, revealed deposits of cuneiform tablets, that is to say, tablets in wedge-shaped script. The texts were partly written with the use by scribes of Sumerian and Akkadian signs or ideograms adapted from scripts of Mesopotamia, and so there was steady progress towards the understanding of the texts. But it was not until the First World War that Czech scholar Rosny, while serving in the Austro-Hungarian army, demonstrated that Hittite was an Indo-European language the texts extend in time from the late 15th century BC to late 13th, thus approximately from 1400 to 1200 BC. There are thousands of them, of the texts altogether, but some 25 or more refer to a land and a king of Achiava. In 1924, the Swiss scholar Emil Forer tentatively claimed that Ahiova was the land of Homer's Achaeans. He even suggested that some Greek heroic names were to be recognised in the Ahiova texts. He was not the first to have looked towards the Achaeans in Hittite texts. Already in 1911, D.D. Luckenbell had suggested that the Greek name Alexandros was to be found in them. However, Forer's claims were bitterly disputed, especially in Germany, where in 1932, Friedrich Sommer published a comprehensively philological study of, with the title Die Achiova Erkunden. You'll find that in your bibliography. There was, however, 
some regard for Forrer's claims elsewhere, especially in this country. For example, they are taken seriously in C.M. Barrow's Tradition and Design in the Iliad, published in Oxford in 1930. That book, by the way, was described by Isaiah Berlin as Barrow's first and best book. <coughs> Disagreements continued, <clears throat> but there was a steady progress in the understanding of the Hittite geography of Asia Minor. A significant advance was made by Oliver Gurney and his uncle, the venerable John Garstang, in their book, The Geography of the Hittite Empire. That, too, is in your bibliography. Their work appeared in 1959 and, in my opinion, made possible agreement on certain identifications. In the coastlands of Western Asia Minor, there could be little doubt that Willusa was Wilios or Ilios, the city of Troy. Hittite Apasas was the place known to the Greeks as Ephesus, and Milawata or Milawanda was Miletus. You'll find these places on your two maps. Zoma had doubted that the name of the land Achiova was the land of Homer's Achaeans, but it had always been difficult to deny that there had been no connection between the name of Achiova and the reconstructable early form of Achaiwia, the land of the Achaeans, or Achaiwoi, Achivi in Latin. We can now move on to consider certain illuminating texts. To repeat, I must be selective. I must also try to avoid speculations. Let us bear in mind that many of the tablets are damaged, and it is not wise ever in epigraphy to rely upon supplements, however attractive they may be. It is proper here to acknowledge the help I have been given by the new edition of the tablets by Beckman, Bryce and Klein. This bears the title, The Ahiova Texts, and was published by the Society of Biblical Literature in the United States in 2011. <clears throat> See the bottom page of two of the handout. The first evidence in our quest for Ahiova comes from the annals of the Hittite king Merciless I. He's on the king list on the first page of your handout. In the third and fourth years of his reign, Merciless was busy in re-establishing Hittite dominance in Western Asia Minor. A rebellion, I'm sorry, a rebellious opponent of Merciless was the ruler of Arzawa, a large western kingdom. His name was Uha Zite. Uha Zite had allied himself with the king of Ahiva, no less. The king is not named, but clearly he'd been extending his interests in the coastlands of western Asia Minor. From the annals of Merciless, we learn that Miletus, or Milawanda, or Milawata, had been at least a foothold, perhaps even a dependency, of the king of Ahiova on the Anatolian mainland. However, in the course of campaigning against Arzawa, Merciless sent two of his generals <coughs> to attack the land of Milawanda. They captured it and took captives and cattle and sheep back to the Hittite capital, Hattusa. 
Milluanda now, it seems, became a Hittite, not an Archeovan, that is to say, not a Mycenaean Greek dependency. <clears throat> this brings us to our second testimony, the so-called Tava Galavas letter. This was sent by the Hittite king to the king of Archeova. <clears throat> the sender is not certainly know, known, but may well have been Hattusilis III. You can find him on your king list. He reigned in the middle of the 13th century BC. The latter is largely concerned with the activities of a freebooter called Pia Maradus, who had fled by ship from Milavanda to the Achiavan territory. The Hittite king asks for help in restraining the troublesome Piamaradus. And it is indeed stated that the ruler in Milavanda, who happened to be the son-in-law of Piamaradus, was instructed to hand over the freebooter to the Hittites. The king's tone in the letter to the king of Ahiova is mild even deferential. Memorably, Dennis Page, in his book History and the Homeric Iliad, wrote of bleating in cuneiform across a wine-dark sea. A lovely, <laughs> memorable expression. That exactly catches it. It is a certain inference from the text that wherever the king of Ahiva lived, the center of his political and military power was not on the mainland of Asia Minor. <clears throat> he is a remote figure, and Pia Maradus flees to his outlying territory by ship. Three more matters to be inferred from the Tevelik Alavas letter are worthy of attention. Firstly, there had been trouble between the Hittites and the Achaeans in the past over Willusa, that is to say, over Troy. The extent of the hostilities is not clear. The crucial word has the stem in Hittite kururi, which could refer to a dispute rather than an all-out war. The trouble obviously has some relevance to possible historical context for the Trojan War. Secondly, it's clear that in their diplomacy, the Hittites accorded a high status to the king of Ahiova. The king of Ahiova is addressed as my brother and given the status of great king, Lugal. Such titles were assigned to the rulers of Babylon, Egypt and Assyria by the Hittites. The ruler in Hattusas, the Hittite emperor, is deliberately recognizing the king of Ahiva as his diplomatic equal. <coughs> Thirdly, there is the activity of the Ahiovan called Tavagalavas. It appears that he was present in person on the mainland of Asia Minor. Also, he is described as brother of the Ahiovan king. The letter refers to a Hittite emissary of high standing who had married into the Hittite queen's family. This exalted person bore the name Tapala Tahunta. The king states, In my youth he mounted the chariot with me, and as a charioteer he often mounted the chariot with your brother, Tavagalava. The incidental remark suggests the likelihood that there were possibilities of close relations between the Hittite and the Hyovan royal families in the time of peace between them. One also hears of a Hittite queen after a fracas at Hattusas being sent into exile with the king of Ahiva. That too suggests a certain amount of diplomatic closeness. 
The name Tevagalavas was compared with the Greek heroic name Etiocles by <coughs> Fora, the equivalent found in the Greek of Mycenaean Linear B tablets of the Late Bronze Age would be Eteco Clairwells. The Hittitekian connections were also religious. At some time, King Merciless II had fallen ill. An oracle was consulted, and one of the questions asked was, should the deity of Ahiva and the deity of Lazpa be brought to the king? Lazpa is the island of Lesbos, which at the time may have been within the Ahiovan sphere of influence. The very fact that an Ahiovan god could be brought, presumably as an image, and at some distance, it seems, testifies to close and peaceful ties at the time. One text has been recognised as a letter from the Ahiovan king to the king of the Hatti, that is, of the Hittites. There was a dispute over control of offshore islands. The king of Assua, a northwestern Asia Minor confederacy, had laid down, had laid claim to the islands, but so also had the Hittites and the Achaeans. The context is not clear, but the islands may have, far in the past, been a dowry of a princess of Asua who married into the Ahiovan royal house. Asua was conquered by the Hittites, who extended their claim after the conquest to the islands nearby. The diplomatic correspondence between Ahiova and the Hittites, obviously, was conducted in both directions. Translators would have been kept busy, but there was no diplomatic archive in cuneiform at, for example, Mycenae, or none has yet been found, or Schliemann may have dumped it, and no Greek in the Linear B script has been found at Hattusas. In the present state of knowledge, speculation is not helpful, but as in all Near Eastern diplomatic correspondence, not only skill with scripts, but also linguistic versatility would have been required not only of scribes, but of reciters and poets. At some point, these texts must have been translated into and out of Greek. To sum up the argument so far, we infer the kings of Ahiova were Achaean, that is to say, Mycenaean Greeks. They were recognised as persons of high standing and treated as diplomatic, independent equals. There were troubles between the two powers over their peripheries in Western Asia Minor and nearby. In times of peace, Ahiovans and Hittites mutually undertook activities such as chariot driving, and there were shared religious and oracular concerns. Mycenaean pottery has been found at Miletus and other coastal places facing the Aegean, and the Hittite capital capture of My My Miletus can be linked to a destruction level there. Though Tavagaravas, possibly Etiocles, was for a time present on the Anatolian mainland, we have no reason to suppose that Ahiovan power was ever centred upon territory there. There were several centres of Mycenaean power in mainland Greece, for example, Mycenae, Tyrans, Pylos, Sparta, and Thebes. There was a group of fortresses in the Argolid, and amongst these, Mycenae 
with its massive cyclopean walling and beehive tombs, is by far the most impressive, even more so than Turin's. If it is asked where, about 1300 BC, was the centre of Achaean power, the most reasonable answer is at Mycenae. It is necessary to keep in mind, however, that in the course of the two to three centuries or so in the late Bronze Age we have been considering, the centre of Mycenaean power could have shifted, even if only within the Argolid. The general impression given in the text is of subordinate rulers subject to a high king and yet free to act independently in defined ways. <clears throat> One such independent dynast may well have been a certain person called in the text Atarissia, who is described in a text dated by most scholars now uh, to earlier in the Hittite imperial period, possibly the early 14th century or late 15th century BC. Atarissias is called not a great king, but a man, Lu, of Ahiava. It seems to me unlikely that he was a Lu girl, a great king. <clears throat> the collection of syllables in the name would make Tarisias rather than Atrus a more plausible equivalent in Greek. Though Fora insisted that Atarisias was the cuneiform equivalent of Atrus, once the king of Mycenae. Atarisias campaigned extensively inland in Asia Minor. The text describing his activities is largely concerned with a rebel called Maduwatas, who at first had been defended against Atarisias by the Hittites. The Achaean intruder posed a serious threat. According to a plausible interpretation, he commanded infantry and a hundred chariots. Atrisias also had access to ships since he attacked Cyprus, the island known to the Hittites as Elasia, and claimed by their king, the Hittite king at the time, Anuwandas, the first to be their own. See page one, item one of your king list. Let us now turn to aspects of the Homeric vision of the past in the Iliad. How much was remembered of events and political structures of the late Bronze Age half a millennium and more before Homer's time. In archaic Greece, many leading families claimed descent from Homeric or other heroes thought to have lived generations previously. But here it will be convenient to look only to Homer. The status of King Agamemnon of Mycenae is a good point for beginning the investigation. He commanded, Homer says, the most and the best troops and the largest fleet of ships to carry them to Troy. The aged and venerable Nestor, king of Pylos, called him Basilutitos, most royal, that is, most authoritative. He has the power to assign territory and the land bestowed is not necessarily near to Mycenae. <coughs> In the embassy to placate the angry and recalcitrant Achilles, the king of Mycenae offers to him seven towns on the coast of the southwestern Peloponnese. And the prosperity of their inhabitants is emphasized. The supreme authority of the kings of Mycenae is symbolized by the scepter of divine origin handed down over the generations. See page 2, item E. 
Excuse me. The craftsman god Hephaestus, says the poet, made the scepter and gave it to the god Zeus. Zeus handed it to the messenger god Hermes, who gave it to the charioteer, charioteer hero Pelops. In succession, in the royal line, it was given to Atreus, who left it to Thyestes, who in turn left it to Agamemnon to be lord over many islands and all Argos that is, the Greek mainland and the islands, or some of them, in the Aegean. Thus Homer understands the notion of a supreme overlord. This is very definitely reminiscent of the position of the kings in Hattusas and the minor kingdoms surrounding them. No such political arrangements existed in Greece in the 8th century BC, but as I hope to have shown, it had existed in the 14th and 13th centuries BC. That is the principal inference to be drawn from the Hittite texts. The Achaean overlordship seems also to be recalled in the very name of the Peloponnese, that is, the island of Pelops, king of Mycenae. Pelops, let us from Enua, came from Asia Minor and was a charioteer. Let us now turn from political organization in Homer to geography. <coughs> we have seen that there were political confrontations between Hittites and Achaeans over Wilusa, Wilios. We have to distinguish as originally also Homer distinguished between Troia, the land of Troy, and Wilios, the citadel of Wilusa. In fact, the two are distinguished in an early Achaean text. There were rival claims to offshore islands near Asua, Lesbos and Tenedos, and possibly Chios also, come to mind. Miletus Milavanda was, sometimes in the domain of the Hittites, sometimes within the Achaean sphere of influence. The report of the campaigning of Atericia shows him on the Anatolian mainland with a large force, and also attacking Cyprus, an island claimed as their own by the Hittites. To what extent there was a permanent presence of Hittite troops in Western Asia Minor is not clear. What is clear is that there are no Hittite participants in the war for Troy as it is perceived by Homer. <coughs> On the other hand, Homer knew of Achaean raids upon the coastlands of northwestern Asia Minor. Of them in legend, the siege of Troy was the most conspicuous, but before the siege itself, there was a mistaken attack upon Tusrania south of the Troad, a territory uh, much disputed in the Hittite texts. The story was related in a lost poem called the Cypria. A summary of the Cypria survives, and we have a few fragments in Greek. The poem narrated events prior to the siege of Troy undertaken by a second expedition to those parts. In all these two assaults, all these two assaults could have taken up the ten years traditionally assigned to the Trojan War. Destruction levels at Troy, in the phases known to the excavators as Troy VI and Troy VII-A, belong to the 13th century and therefore can be compared to the traditional era of the Trojan War, as it appears in, for example, the historian Herodotus, whose date for the fall of Troy works out as equivalent to about 1240 BC. Homer knew 
that there had been more than one destruction of Troy. He mentions that Wilios had been sacked by the great hero Heracles a generation or so earlier than the siege of in the time of Agamemnon. The poet also recalls that there have been Achaean attacks on the Aegean coastlands of Anatolia during the campaign against Troy. Achilles, before his quarrel with Agamemnon, had engaged in forays upon the southern Troad. Homer names Thebe, Lernessos, and Pedasos as places having been attacked before the taking of booty by the swift-footed hero Achilles. Achilles lost to Agamemnon the captive woman Briseis, and as a consequence, Achilles withdrew from the fighting with disastrous consequences for the Achaeans besieging Troy town, Wilios. I have said that Homer knows nothing of Hittites or of any Hittite participation in the attack on Troy. The statement, however, is in need of a caveat. In the visit of Odysseus to the underworld, as it is described in the Odyssey, the hero meets the shade of Achilles, among those of other heroes and heroines. Odysseus is asked by Achilles about his son Neoptolemus. The Ithacan hero tells how <coughs> he fetched the now grown up Neoptolemus from the Isle of Scaros and brought him to Troy where he distinguished himself on the battlefield. Among those Neoptolemus killed was Eurypylus, son of Telephus of Teuthrania, a land attacked by the Achaeans before the siege of Troy itself. Odysseus says of the episode, about Eurypylus, Many of his comrades, Kitaioi, were killed because of womanly gifts. The allusion to womanly gifts is obscure, but the elusive poet assumes that his audience would recognize it. For Kitaioi, see page 2, item 3b. In an article published in 1959, I revived a suggestion made originally by William Hewitt Gladstone, no less, um, that Kitai might be Hattians or Hittites <coughs> settled in Tuthrania. Thereabouts was also a river near Pergamon called the Kitaios. The name may well again recall the presence of a Hittite or pre-Hittite Hattian settlement. Kitaioi is the form of the name in Homeric, mainly Ionic dialect of Greek, but in the apparatus criticus of scholarly texts of the Odyssey, the variant with a high, not a capital, Kitaioi is found. This in the original Greek form would have been Hatioi. It is close to Hatti, the indigenous, non-Indo-European name adopted by the Hittites. It is thus possible that there was a faint memory among the archaic Greeks about 700 BC of a Hittite involvement in the late stage of the Trojan War. There is plenty of evidence of Hittite concern for Wilios Wilusa. We have already met Alexandrus of Wilusa, whose name Luckenbill long ago are compared with Alexandros in Greek. Alexandros was, as it happens, an alternative name of the Trojan prince Paris. A Willusian ruler called Walmar was exiled, it seems, in about the middle of the 13th century in the reign of King Tutelius IV of Hatti. Walmar was a vassal ruler of the Hittite king who restored him or intended to restore him to rule in Willusa. 
We have seen, too, that the Cairns and Hittites had for a time been in dispute over Willus or Wilios. There are many more details to be taken into account, such as the extent to which the Hittites may have devolved power to vassal rulers in outlying territories. But in general, there's nothing unreasonable in the supposition that the king of Hattie did not approve a Hitta, a, an Achaean expedition to Willusa Wilios, an expedition recalled by generations of poets, forerunners of Homer, in the tale of Troy. There is a coda to the history of two competing powers, Achiava and Hattie. The name Achaea survived in the north of the Peloponnese and in Phthia, south of Thessaly, which had been the kingdom of Achilles. There also was an Achaea polis, Achaea city in Rhodes, and there was a Roman province of Achaea. But imperial Achaia and imperial Hatti collapsed in the great migrations about 1200 BC. One consequence of these movements was the arrival of Philistines in Palestine, to which they gave their name. Another was the survival in Syria of Neo-Hittites, who are known to us from monuments and from the Old Testament. A sign of decline in the power of Ahiava is a late Hittite imperial text of the time of Tutalias IV, thus mid to later 13th century BC, where in a treaty the king specifies the kings who are his equals in rank. They are the kings of Egypt, Babylonia and Assyria. In the draft of the treaty, the scribe wrote, by mistake it seems, and the king of Ahiava, and then crossed it out. The best explanation is that Ahiava was no longer regarded at Hattusas as a great power, but rather one in decline. There was a legend that an Achaean ruler called Mopsos, his, the Mycenaean form of the name was Mokwaso, migrated from Claros near Colophon in western Asia Minor to Cilicia in the south of Asia Minor. There he established a kingdom where his name was recalled in some place names, including Mopsu Hestia. Turkish excavations at Kara Tepe after the Second World War revealed a palace of the late 8th century BC with inscriptions in two languages, Luvian uh, and Phoenician. Luvian is a distinct language closely related to Hittite. The texts refer to the house of Muxas or Mups, as is to say, of Mopsas. More recently, there was discovered another set of bilinguals near Adana in Cilicia. Here, a king called Warika also claimed to be a descendant of Mukasa or Mopsas. He declared that he was a servant of the storm god, who was very prominent in Anatolian pantheons, and to have extended the territory of Kiawa uh, from his base in his palace. Kiawa is a shortened variant of the name Ahiava. Thus the name of Ahiava survived, albeit in two other languages, one of them linked to Hittite, into the later 8th century BC. Warica, who ruled uh, about 738 BC, uh, set up his inscriptions at about the same time as were those that Karatepe were set up. It's not a coincidence that the historian, his Herodotus, said that Cilicians were originally called Hup Achaioi, or sub Achaeans. It is also relevant that at the end of the Bronze Age, a type of late Mycenaean pottery, classed as late Helladic 3C of the 11th century, is found in Cilicia and reflects the arrival of newcomers. 
Thus, the archaeological evidence points to a migration of Achaeans in the time of troubles at the epoch of Mycenaean and also Hittite collapse. It's remarkable that at Colophon, and this evidence is often overlooked, that at Colophon, the original home of Mopsos, there was a Mycenaean tholos or beehive tomb. This was discovered in the early 1920s by American excavators. Sadly, the evidence was mostly lost because their work had to be left incomplete owing to the war between Greeks and Turks. Prima facie, the tomb may well be testimony to a settled Achaean presence at Colophon. The date of that tomb uh, was almost certainly late Atlantic 3B, that's in 13th century. Uh, I have this from a very valuable source, namely the late and great Hetty Goldman, who at tea in 1956 told me it was late Atlantic 3B. <laughs> <clears throat> the story of the migration of Mopsus is part of the tale of the Nostoi, or returns of heroes from Troy. Not all the heroes were able to return home, and some were widely scattered. The Nostoi may well reflect the disturbances at the end of the Bronze Age, when there were great migrations. Imperial Hetty and Imperial Mycenae were destroyed, and two great bodies of migrants, after defeat in the delta of Egypt, settled in the Levant. Consequences of these movements were the creation of Luvian-speaking Neo-Hittite states in Syria, the invasion of Cyprus and Cilicia by disrupted Achaeans, and the coming of the Philistines to Palestine. Thus the tale of Troy takes us far afield, but the story, we can hardly doubt, is rooted in the Aegean world of the Achaeans and in territories of the great kings of Hatto. <coughs> How memories of, event, of events survive for half millennium in the minds of poets and reciters and remembrancers among Greeks and in Asia Minor, is another question and another story. But that problem is not the subject of this letter, lecture. Thank you for listening patiently to a very old man who to many of you must seem like a voice from the past. <laughs>